Hey, it's Chris, Luigi Games. Let's talk Kickstarters that have launched this week. This is the big one. This is going to be a long video. Hopefully, I've been able to sparse it down so that you're not stuck for too long listening to my voice. Did you know that Pinky and the Brain, one is a genius and the other is insane? It really sort of just clicked for me the other day as a side note that Pinky is the genius one and Brain is the insane one. Anyway, <laughs> completely random trivia for you there. Let's talk Kickstarters. And let's start off with something that was not on my radar, but one of the people that I really respect on the Japanese coverage of the indie designing board games sort of brought it up on Twitter. And so I think it's worth a mention here. So let's go right into it and let's start with that. Shogi is known as the game of generals from Japan emanating, they think, around the 15th century. And the problem with it is it has not easily translated to a broader market because most of the time Shogi has kanji symbols on the pieces that say what they are and what they do. Here you can see what is more of the traditional shogi kanji that's on there. As you can tell, it's not something that you can just intuitively pick up and it's something you would have to literally memorize and even some of these pieces differentiate by smaller amounts than you would like. So it's sort of a combination or a go between between chess and go. <laughs> see what I did there? And the level of complexity is right in there as well. Now, the problem, as you can see, is someone for English speaking like myself, that I just can't tell that. So what this person has done is that they have designed universal pieces that show the directionality as well as the movements of the shogi pieces so that it can be played by non-Japanese speakers or kanji readers. And I think this is worth talking about because this is a game I've always been interested in and I've just never been able to give a fair shake because it falls heavily on the abstract, which I love. I'm not a big fan of chess. I'd love to learn how to play Go, but I don't really have the time frame for either. And I think this is a nice medium. Now, why am I going to talk about this campaign? Because again, I think it deserves a spotlight, even though it's not going to be for necessarily a lot of you watching this channel. It's worth talking about because again, this is something innovative coming out of Japan, which I love to see. The problem with it, as you can see, is most of the time Shogi is done in wooden pieces. And the the, the problem is that the lowest pledge level to really get you the full Shogi experience is this $96 pledge level right here, or 10,000 yen, which gets you the 40 ceramic pieces, but it does not get you sort of the board as well. If you want to get the board as well with it, the wood framed edition, it's going to be $124. And there are lower pledge levels where you can get sort of the Le Shogi or the Mini, the Pop Shogi is what they call it. And what those are is you can scroll down here and just see it's like a three by three board and then a four by six board. So again, to help learn the pieces and how to manipulate and use the pieces as they say, but it's not really gonna be the full experience. And for me personally, if I'm gonna pay that price, I'd love to get the three by three or the four by six, but I wanna get more of the experience. So you could always do the smaller board if you really wanted to on the bigger board, but the bigger board is really gonna cost you. They have a little sticker version as well that you can do, but I just wish the price point was lower because I would be all over this. I have It's weird that I have a hard time justifying $100 for a game that I might never otherwise be able to play, period, because of interpretation issues, but I'll throw down double that amount on a Kickstarter that may not hit the table for three or four years. It's the way my mindset works. I don't know if you guys have been there, but I wanna bring it to other people's attention because it's funding, you can get it. I think it's worthwhile. I think other people show interest. I might reach out to the designer and see, maybe, maybe they can send me a review copy because I would love to give this game publicity as well because I'd love to see more of this. Anyway, I hope you watched this part. If you didn't, um, the next one will probably be more to your speed anyway. But again, I like talking about these types. First up we have is Stroganov. Now I talked about this last week. Stroganov is really the first big Euro to get launched in February. It's already almost twice its funding goal within the first 12 hours. So what do you need to know about Stroganov? As I mentioned before, Stroganov is a little bit different take than a lot of the other worker placement Euro style games that we have seen launch in 2021. What do I mean by that? Well, for starters, some of the similarities is, okay, it has a solo version. This is a deluxe version. If you're gonna back it on Kickstarter, my recommendation almost always is get the deluxe version. And thankfully they have nothing but the deluxe version. So it makes your choice really, really simple. It's gonna run you about $72, which is about middling expected value, maybe slightly less because I don't think there's as much stuff physically that comes with this game. But what do you actually need to know? Now I talked about it last week. It is a game designed over four years, four seasons in each year. So 16 total rounds. 
three of those seasons in each round, spring, summer, and fall, you're going to be doing actions. Winter is going to take you back to basically the start, the headquarters, and you're going to score, and you're going to produce, and that sort of thing is going to happen. As with all good deluxe Euros, you're going to get yourself a nice game tray, and you're going to get yourself the obligatory coins. Side ramble here. Are metal coins a big market, like markup-wise, on Kickstarter? Like, is that the reason people do them? Like, there's a bigger profit margin? Or is it just that everybody thinks they have to have their own metal coin? Like, like people are going around at the conventions and trading them like pins? I don't know. That'd be a cool idea, though. Anyway, so this game is a lot different than a lot of the other Euros that I've seen recently, especially with Tinner's Trail, Darwin's Journey, and Carnegie. And what do I mean by that? I mean that just by that, it seems to be relatively shorter and it doesn't seem to have as much overhead. For me, as a non-Euro person, I read this rule book and this rule book, it was much easier to understand than either of those other three rule books that I just mentioned. And so that's the best comparison I can give you. As a person who does not play these and does not like as much overhead in terms of the minutia of the rules that I have to know and the combos and, you know, this happens with this and then this happens with this, this one was much more relatable and understandable. Now, let me be clear, it did not seem to lack any of the variability in terms of the options that some of those other have, but at the same time, it may not have quite the depth that it has with some of those others. If you're just going to make a straight up comparison of, okay, well, this one has 37 different things that you can choose from, and this one only has 15. Well, well yeah, that's that's gonna be the case, but, but there is also a case to be made of the fact that there can be too much of a good thing in the first place. Definitely some of the Euros out there are prone to that, just like the non-Euros. We don't call it like that sometimes, the Euro bloat, like you do with some of the other campaign style or miniature level games where you call it bloat there. But I think the same thing is bound to happen in some of these games as well. Like I said, Rulebook, Rado, Paul. You've got all three of those right there. So you should have everything you need if you're looking to and being interested in backing this game. We've got some stretch goals. We've got some follow goals. We've got the additions. We've got some art add-on. And you've got a little bit of review from Man vs. Meeple and a couple other places. So what do you actually need to know about this game? What do you need to know about the rules? Like I said, you're going to be going out. You're going to be going out on this board, as I mentioned, and you're going to be moving your Cossack further to the right. And the furthest person to the right is the person that goes first. And you are going to be taking these actions at the top left-hand corner of the board and usually filling them up in terms of outposts or what you can do there with different resources. And so there's going to be an advantage to getting out further. Also, you get more points. You get more story points, which are important when you come back during the winter phase in order to buy the song cards. And so there's varied elements. In terms of what are you actually doing on your turn, though, the first thing you do is just your very basic action. And then you perform either one or two main actions, which can either be the basic action or a more advanced option as well. The trick is you're going to be building outposts along your way that are going to give you better access to more resources and furs and things like that. But you can also then use those actions at places where you have a previous outpost, even if you're not there on your turn. So what are those actions? Here you go. Take a coin, get some horses, move, or you hunt. Hunt is getting your furs. Furs are one of your main resources. So that's the first thing you're doing every single time. Or you perform one or two of the main actions, either of which can be the basic or the advanced. And so here you go. You have options, but you don't have an overwhelming amount of options. So they list five options right there. I'm not going to break all those down, but let's just talk about them real briefly. Visit the village, use a yurt, take a czar's wish card, build an outpost, or claim a landscape tile. So all of these things are going to be interacting. So you're going to have the combination of four and the combination of five. That's a fair amount. And then they talk about here, you know, how do you score and what happens in winter and income and administration and the end game. It comes with a solo version, as all good Euro games do now, so no one's going to miss out from that standpoint. So what do I think of it? Full disclaimer, if you've watched any of my videos, I am not a Euro person. This is an easy pass for me. I have no interest in Euros. But of the four that I mentioned earlier, this looks like the far easiest in terms of accessibility for someone who is not in the deep, heavier Euro side of things, just on the periphery. Now, I can't speak because I haven't played it, but like I mentioned, reading the rule book, looking at the summary, looking at the scoring, it seems the most intuitive of all of the four that I've mentioned. It is the most appealing to me in general, and I think it has the nicest aesthetic 
of all four of those in the first place. And I think it offers something different because of this horizontal track that you're going to be spacing the COSEX trying to move farther and farther out on until you just can't get out there, but you're going to be significantly benefit if you can be the furthest one out. So there you go. I mean, it's already funded. You're going to be getting a good game. I don't think there's any question about that. It's just how does it compare to the other ones? Is this looking like more of something you would like or not? The price point is about right. Deluxification, it's going to depend on how many stretch goals, but I think you're going to be getting a solid product. Okay, so next up, let's talk mouse, cheese, cat, cucumber. Now, this is one I missed, but it's already over double its funding goal. And this is a little bit of a different take. This is an asymmetric tile laying game with a secret agenda and the secret agenda being you are one of these four characters the mouse the cat the cucumber or the cheese and what are you trying to do each one has a very specific objective in this game and you basically are building this maze as you play it and you can see here with the little cucumber flying around to distract you in the background you're laying down these pieces these pieces have gears on the side of them that tell you that you flip any piece adjacent to them on that side in a certain direction and you are trying to achieve a certain objective because you don't know who is who you don't know the mouse is the mouse the cat is the cat the cheese is the cheese and the cucumber is the cucumber the mouse needs to be able to catch the cheese and not be caught by the cat the cat needs to catch the mouse but not cannot allow the mouse to get the cheese. The cucumber wants both of these things to happen, and the cheese wants none of these things to happen. The cheese is like Switzerland, the cucumber they say is evil and chaotic. So all you're doing is basically picking up a tile and placing it down. Now you can see that this is not just a scale representation, but you can't have more than a five by five grid. So you are going to have to be using the areas that are already there and you're going to have to be overlaying them. Now, when you lay a tile down, one of these animals, like the mouse, has to be able to go through the one you just played. And it can end wherever you want it to because it's going to have branching points, but it has to go through the tile you just played. That's important because that affects where you're going to play it as well. It comes with a couple different modes. There's multiplayer for just a basic pledge level. It's 13 bucks. $20 is the oversized pledge. 69 gets you everything with acrylic tiles in a bag. Acrylic tiles are kind of nice, but completely unnecessary. So here you go. Here are the other pledge levels. Honestly, at the $13 pledge, it's probably worth uh, a real heavy look at it, especially if this has any interest to you. But I think with all asymmetry games, the question is just overhead. And so the overhead, though, in this game, unlike a lot of the other larger asymmetric faction type games, is just that the overhead is, is a lot lower. And so it means that it's going to be able to get to the table a lot easier. I think there's going to be the potential for analysis paralysis with some of this, with the rotating gears and where you're going to play the tiles. But it's a lot easier to get to the table uh, than anything else out there that I've seen with the asymmetry of four different factions in that sense. The expansions that I mentioned here, you're adding more special guests uh, that are going to have various powers. No idea what they are. They don't talk about it in the rule book. And then you have these adding a different ability, I'm assuming, with the four main characters that are out there in the first place or that are just randomly applied that you can do. The other thing I didn't mention is on your agenda card as one of the four mains, the cheese, the cucumber, the mouse or the cat. You also have a hidden power that is a one-time use only when you reveal your agenda. Only when you reveal, I am the cat. I get to use this power. Boom. If the cucumber card ever reaches the table, because it's usually at the bottom of the deck or near there, the game ends immediately and you, you score based on those conditions that I meant earlier. They're adding a little bit of a stretch goal, but... I think it's superfluous at this point. The base and the stuff that's being offered should either entice you or not. I don't think this is one where stretch goals are really going to make it or break it. In fact, I think you could ignore the stretch goals and either be happy or make your decision not to back this just on that. So this is a very unique game. I'm glad I read through it. It's not going to be probably for me because I just don't have a dedicated enough four player group that would probably be interested. There'd be too much AP for me even in this lower complexity game, but this is definitely going to be a hit for some people. Definitely. Mark my words. La Clivia, Vengeance. This is the next one up that just launched as well. It's a co-op for one to four players. Now, this is a little bit of a different type of castle defense, tower defense type game. We all know the tower defense from the mobile app games and things like that. <laughs> Obviously, with the other big tower defense game running over on GameFound as well, we're seeing it there. What makes this different is it has the worker placement. And I've not really seen this before, and I had to really read the rules to try to get a better sense of it. 
you have this main central board with these four villages and each of the player boards is a different color and represents a different village and you're going to be training your workers training your heroes training your warriors to defend it but also to get resources to build weapons and to just produce more things to allow you to build walls and things like that each of the areas that you're going to go to you can build or you can get the resources but then you also have to rest each one of the villages has a different ability that basically allows them not to have to rest in certain areas how you're going to be taking turns is on your turn you're going to be drawing basically a card from the deck that either says all clear meaning there's no enemy or the enemy is going to spawn and you all have to battle the enemy in the first round it's the raccoon scout and you're all battling him simultaneously which they say is a little bit different because in subsequent rounds two and three everyone may be battling at a different time so your partner sitting next to you may be going to get resources you may be battling the guy next to you may be battling and the fourth person may be getting resources as well and there's a little bit of cooperative teamwork there and sharing but if your city gets overrun and you have to evacuate it and you have to move all your meeples elsewhere so there's a lot going on frankly speaking i'm not a big fan of how i saw the workers being incorporated in this because like i mentioned before if you haven't heard one of the hundred other videos i am not a worker placement person so this has a little bit too much worker placement for me personally but i have not seen another game like this that utilizes it in both of those combinations tower defense games in and of themselves are relatively uncommon throw in the worker placement you've got very very unique game you've got a very unique theme you've got a very unique background this is not a game like any other I've seen out there. And I think that's going to be where the most divisive element is. You can already see they are just barely under the funding goal. They're literally less than like 12 hours in at this point. So it's easily going to fund. It's just going to be a matter of how much other stuff gets thrown on top of this at this point. Pledge levels are actually very reasonable. $39 because there's no miniatures. They're going with standees. Uh, a lot of cubes. Uh, you know, And I think that's great for a first time person because this game doesn't need it. It's worker placement and it's tower defense neither of those really screams i need that sort of thing and so i'm glad they just didn't add it sort of superfluously over the top and you can get that a little bit without they did have an early pledge but that was signed sketch of an enemy by the artist so again that's not a big deal that's not a big deal at all i think they've done a relatively good job of organizing this as very good entry level project it's definitely not for me i definitely have no interest in it but this is going to appeal to a lot of the people that are looking for that new combination like we've seen with the deck building worker placement i think you're going to get a lot of crossover there or potentially a lot of crossover in the future with the worker placement type genre in the first place all in all it'll be interesting to see what this actually looks like at retail i don't think they have a whole lot of stretch goals up right now check it out if it's of interest to you Shadow Tactics, the board game, the relaunch, no, not really the relaunch, the 2.0, well, not really the 2.0, the late backing campaign, well, not really the late backing campaign either. It's sort of the second campaign for the same game that funded over two years ago. I put a video out on this earlier in the week, and I think these guys are going to make a good project. I'm not sure how good it's going to be because they acquiesced to a lot of the backers, I think, the first time around, and now it's a solo, it's a co-op, and it's competitive, it's a one versus many. It's basically everything under the sun. And I feel like when you have that many modes, it definitely can detract from one or even maybe at most two where you can really focus your energy, tighten down because it's a bloat in a different way. That makes me a little bit, mm, but I'm also not a huge fan of the hidden movement type game. So this doesn't appeal to me in that sense. But Shadow Tactics is a very well-regarded IP, I believe from PlayStation originally, from the PS4, I believe originally, but also it's been ported elsewhere. And they're basically doing a 14-day campaign to allow people who missed the first campaign to get in basically at the same pledge level, at the same price. They're offering a few additional add-ons that are different. They're offering a slight discount if you're a returning backer, but only if you buy certain expansions or uh, deluxifications. And it's just kind of a weird scenario. I I'm not really sure why this is necessary at this point. Because there is no difference between this and late backing, except late backing, I would think that it would have less of the fees taken out that you're going to inevitably lose by going through Kickstarter. So it doesn't really make sense in my brain. And the page doesn't really talk about it at all either. So I'm not really sure what to make of that. Antler Games has done a couple other good games. They've delivered on the other projects. So again, I don't really have that concern. But it just leaves me with this weird feeling. 
The pledge levels, like I said, here's the add-on for returning backers, $17, but you get a five euro credit if you buy one of like the three things that they're new in the deluxifications. You get the base game, which is $72. That's expensive for a base game. Samurai Pledge, $92, gets you the expansion plus the exclusives. And the $115 gets you the uh, exclusive solo co-op expansion on top of that. So it's basically the same thing. Here you go. You're getting the Kickstarter exclusive stuff. You're talking about the hidden action programming. You can't talk to each other. You know, it sort of reminds me of a medieval version of V Commandos in a way. I love the ninja theme, but with the hidden movement combination, I just is an easy pass for me. The rule book is out there. There's videos out there. You can start to see what it actually is. I mean, it looks very nice. I like the aesthetic. They've got a couple other add-ons and expansions down here. The Tanuki expansion, some deluxifications for the structures so that you can make them miniatures instead of cardboard some linen stuff, another laser cut wooden tray. So they're not doing any stretch goals on this. So there's not really a whole lot else new to talk about in this campaign. Just that it's sort of going again. Okay, I guess. So if you miss it the first time around, you can get in. They're already three times the funding goal. So that's great. I don't know what to make of this. Smarter people out there than me will have better takes on this, but those are my initial thoughts and my impressions. So uh, hopefully the people that are back in this get a good game in the end because it's a great IP, it's a great theme, and I hope it really translates well from a video game side of things. Next up, we have Vault Wars Relic Roadshow. I talked about this last week. This is the expansion to Vault Wars. came out in 2015. Vault Wars is an auction-style game where if you basically think of Storage Wars, the show, the show that it was, let me, it's a whole other side tangent. Think of that combined with Dungeons & Dragons combined with now we're throwing in additional elements, including the biggest problem with auction style games is you have the winner get something and the losers get nothing else. You're taking the second place person getting the ability to craft powerful items to make up for the fact that the other person who won the item or the storage item bin selection that you wanted in the first place so that you can play a little bit of catch up while still not getting what you want in the first place. And here you go. Exactly the name that they put to this is a relic. And in case you're wondering about the game as the first style, the bidding, um, you know, again, it's an auction. You don't see a ton of auction games, especially with the fantasy theme. So it's nice to see those two incorporated as opposed to just something typical. You see a lot of art. You see a lot of artistical, uh, you know, craft type things. Tom Vassell gave it the seal of excellence. So if you need to know something about it, that's what you need to know. So what are you going to do? You've got new vaults. Again, bidder access second place to the relics. You bid and bluff. If you're inspiring villains, uh, compete with heroes so you can get different rewards if you're trying to be a little bit of a bad guy. And, you know, you have vices. So they're adding a whole bunch of elements to this game. I think this is the example of something that hopefully takes, like, Champions of Midgard with Scoundrels of Skullport expansion and makes it sort of an essential. But I just don't know. I, again, this is not, thankfully, a very strong week for me on Kickstarter because I am also not a big auction person. I had this game, it never hit to the table, and I just sold it to someone locally. But it looks solid. I mean, it's got a little bit lower rating on Board Game Geek. I think the Board Game Geek rating was like six and a half overall. But I think that is probably more reflective of the fact that auction games, like I just mentioned, for me, are a miss. And I think if you went into this thinking it was going to be more fantasy-esque and you found out it was more of an auction game, auction games just don't appeal. They don't have the broad appeal that like a worker placement or a deck builder may in the broad sense to have the broad spectrum of reviews that are going to even it out more. And so you're going to have more extremes on this. And I think that rating sort of reflects it. This is a great deal. $12 for the new stuff. I think that's absolutely a tremendous deal. $30 gets you um, the core game and the expansion here, it looks like. And $50 gets you the deluxified version. So again, this isn't a huge game, but that's a lot lower price than I would have expected nowadays on Kickstarter. So I really appreciate that. So it doesn't feel like you're getting nickeled and dimed. Uh, they're going to be giving away play mats to two lucky backers. So that's awesome. Is that per day? Yeah, each day. That's impressive. And they're going to have no stretch goals. So what you see is what you get. There you go. Relatively solid. I mean, this is the type of quality that we're seeing now. And this is what makes Kickstarter so troublesome is because there's a lot of stuff out there that is just solid, solid, solid. And it's becoming more and more niche for better and for worse. If this interests you, if you didn't check out the base game, you know, there's enough info out there right now. There's enough videos and reviews for the base game that you should check it out because this is probably just going to make the base game more well thought of because it looks like they're not making too much, but they're making it so that it's a little bit more, more mitigation, more variables and not in a bad way. 
So here we have Beasts of Balance Rebirth. Now they market it as Jenga meets Pokemon in the connected stacking game with a virtual element where you are scanning these little Digimon, Pokemon type creatures that are basically a 3D version of animal upon animals. And that has maybe a power and you're trying to balance them and achieve certain objectives. I really wanna like this. This is a game I would love to get for my kids because it's stacking, it's requiring dexterity. My kids are familiar with some of these animals. And in this one, they're adding a whole lot of this stuff that you know kids love, the fantasy stuff. They're adding dinosaurs, they're adding a phoenix, you know, they've got all the octopus, the bear, you know, just some cool looking animals. Like I like this aesthetic art, but it's completely unpalatable from a family standpoint because just the expansion that doesn't even include the base game is $65. And I understand that there is a digital component to this, but that is ridiculous. $99, I, I feel like the standard edition, I feel like that was maybe the one that was, uh, you know, a year or so, a year or two ago, was in Sam's Club for like 20 bucks all of a sudden on sale. Maybe I'm wrong, but I know there was a Beast of Balance that was in that section. So maybe it was a slightly modified version, but either way, even if I'm getting like half the content, $20 versus $100 in the Kickstarter, I just can't justify that. The Kickstarter exclusive edition, $125, everything for $175. And if you want every freaking thing here, all these individual expansions, and that's where it really nickels and dimes you, $345. Now, what am I talking about when I say the individual expansions? There are literally like single ones here that you can see the dinosaurs expansion that's additional. Here's the other thing. So add-ons, one guy, one guy. One guy, one guy, $20 each, one guy, one guy, one guy. So I know that some of these are out of print and some of these are hard to get. So you're really playing to a lot of FOMO, I think, with some of these. And again, I would love to get this. Like if these guys want to send me a copy, I would totally review this and totally talk about this. So if Modern Games, if you're out there, if you hear this video, if you by chance stumble upon this and you want to send me a copy of this, I would love to show myself playing it with my five and my seven-year-old and seeing how it compares to some of the other stuff that they have played that I've talked about. But for the price point, it's just way too big for me to get a kid's game. And I'm not sure this is a game that I would be able to sit down with my regular gamer group and have them be necessarily as engaged with initially. So I, I, for me, it's a pass. The aesthetic there is just fabulous and I would love to see it in person and try it out, but it is definitely a super, super strong try before you buy because for that price point, you better be 100% certain that you're going to you're gonna like it and you're going to get it to the table often. There you go. So you've been waiting for it. Let's talk Bloodstone by Druid City Games. You can see that already, again, less than 12 hours in, we are well over the funding goal by almost a third right now. And so the question just is, how high is this going to go? What sort of love is this going to reach? And what is going to sort of propel it? Because they're not doing the traditional stretch goals. Now, if you're not familiar with what Bloodstone is, if you missed my previous video a couple weeks ago on Bloodstone and what to expect from it, this is an arena style PVP or a PVE style game where you take your combatants and you fight against a monster AI boss battling sort of situation. From the get-go, the biggest thing you need to know about it is that it's not going to retail. Uh, James Hudson has been very transparent. There's a video actually down towards the bottom of the page that says exactly why it's not going to retail because of the size, the expense, the logistics, the distribution, all of that stuff just makes it more of impossible. I don't know if they talk about you know store distribution from their own personal store, but either way, I wouldn't be surprised. How do I feel about this game? What do you need to know about this game? Now, one to eight players, that would be insane. I can't imagine playing any of these games with eight players, especially if it's the PV let alone the pvp because the pvp i think if you get more than like three or four pvp is very tough to balance and it becomes a gang up and it's going to be quick elimination especially i think when you start to get down to the nitty-gritty i'm not sure not having watched as much of the gameplay yet how much of a slugfest how much of a back and forth how prolonged at the lower player counts on a one-on-one -on -one or a one-on-one-on-one -on -one -on -one, is it going to be because you definitely don't want to have the exclusion of some of those other people those five other people if you're left with three that are just sitting there for like half an hour, 45 minutes or an hour before the game actually ends. I mean, it's one thing if it's King of Tokyo where it's like five minutes, but with something like this with multiple layers of complexity and dice rolling and five phases per turn, 
there is more potential for that. It's also going to be very hard. He makes it very clear that this is not a game where you are going to go on one strategy and you are going to beat boss after boss after boss after boss. You're going to die. You're going to have to change. You're going to have to adjust. You're going to have to minimize what you're doing wrong each time and maximize the strategy going in beforehand and afterwards. Now, the price point is sort of the thing that I was really wondering about that was the, going to be the biggest make it or break it for me. And to be frank with you, I'm still sort of undecided. The price point is actually a little bit less than I thought. The base game is $125. So that is a bit more than I thought. I did not think the base game itself was going to be $125. The interesting thing is how they've chosen to do the other pledge levels. The other pledge levels, you get a novel and an expansion for $160, and they say $5 discount, so this would be $165 if you bundled it all together, because I believe they're each $20. And then $199 for everything, including custom D20s, an expansion, a novel, and the base game, and the special playmat. Now, I don't see what the playmat is made of. I may have missed that, but it's, it looks like it's going to be like a neoprene, which is great. The neoprene is probably the biggest decision point that I would have if I'm going to get this. Because, again, if they're going to say retail, you know that the expansion is probably going to be more at retail-esque if they go through their eShop. Because there's no way that that would sell for $20. I don't care. It's not going to be listed for that, especially when you factor in shipping. It's going to cost you probably $40 to $50. So if you're going to get it, I think the question is you get the expansion and the game. What else do you want to get on top of that or nothing else? So that's really the pledge level I'm looking at right now is the $125 where these $323 are plus the expansion for another $25, which is $145. Do I get the playmat on top of that? Because I don't want to pay for the non-gameplay extras, the novel, the dice, and I think there's maybe one other thing in there. But that is why that is the pledge level that I'm looking at. Now, what else do you need to know? Okay, 48-hour chat, we get 5,000 backers within the first 48 hours. I don't think that's going to happen. That's going to be tough because you're only at 1,812 hours. So you would essentially need to uh, almost keep that up maybe by 75% over the next 36 hours. And that's going to be tough because that's a lot of people in the first 48 hours especially when the pledge level is this high. Board Game Co. quote, here you go, They're talking about the pledge levels. You got some ability tokens, you've got the dice. And this is where the big asymmetry comes in, is this is a dice roller, like I mentioned. So each of these enemies, but also the heroes themselves, are going to be having different ways of activating their powers. So like if you're rolling singles or doubles or triples of the same number, it's going to give you the ability to access higher level powers on your board during your action phase. And so you can take either like an attack where you're just adding up all the numbers that you deal and then dealing that, or you can take an ability that allows you to activate one of the things and may also allow you to attack in addition to that or separately. The other main concern, I guess, that people would have in a dice roller action attacker is, well, what if he rolls all sixes and I roll all ones? So they've already thought about that, and they've already sort of tried to mitigate that a little bit in two ways. One, you have the blood energy track here along the side of the board, and I'll talk about that in a second. The second thing that you have are these reward and experience cards. These reward and experience cards come in handy because if you roll a sum total of your attack to be less than 10, you are drawing two of these cards. They are giving you a bonus. It can either be a permanent upgrade bonus or it can be a one-time use effect and you just get it. And so there are abilities that will deal more damage, but since you didn't roll more than 10, you can still get that experience arena bonus upgrade. And then the blood energy allows you access to a special power that your character has that you get to flip over and have a use. I'm not sure if it's a one time or if it's a constant effect, but it's basically a power up for your character. Now, what are you doing? You're fighting. I mean, it's melee it's pvp the other element is that all of these monsters that are included have their own ai decks and so depending on who's closest you're going to have the ability to you know either interact with them or they're going to have special things laid on the map that are you're going to be ha having to go into or avoid and so there's gonna be a lot of interaction in that sense even between the players and the ai the other element of things like i mentioned with the dice is the dice are unique some dice will allow you to get special damage to get special abilities just different sides going to do different things. Other dice allow you to insert your dice into other people's rolling or even the enemy's rolling, or the enemy can insert his dice into your roll. So when you have to roll, you're potentially having something bad happen to you, even on your turn, even if it's not his turn. Or it pulls you, it does like a scorpion, you know, from Mortal Kombat, get over here, and it pulls you into the area you've been trying to avoid in the first place. So there's a lot going on. Now, a lot of the usual suspects have taken a look at this. 
So I've read the rules. The rules are not terribly deep and complete. It's sort of like an eight page rule book. So it's definitely not the full thing, but it gives you a glimpse of what to expect. Board Game Co and Quackalope are doing their thing together again. You've got a couple other videos from the Dice Tower, another one from Quackalope, and they're going to be doing daily reveals. And I'm not sure what these reveals are going to be. I think it's just content in terms of sort of the background. And so I'm interested to see what else is that going to add because they don't really talk too much else about what to expect later on in the campaign. You see some of the enemies down here. In fact, you might see all of the enemies, which, frankly speaking, I kind of wish they went with the Oathsworn approach where hide a couple of the enemies from me so I don't know what I'm getting. But at the same time, with a price point like this, I think you might be afraid to not show people what they're actually paying for so that they can get a little more enticed by the visualization of these miniatures. So we'll see. Oh, looks like we have one final monster reveal on March 10th. So here you go. Here's the shipping. Shipping's expensive because this is a big game. This is not going to be for everyone. This is definitely not going to be for everyone. I am mixed on this. I sort of half regret my pledge for Primal at this point just because availability and being able to get this to the table. I think this would be easier for me to get to the table personally as a PvP boss battler because I think the thing that concerns me in comparison to Primal is Primal has more deck construction and I don't know how many of my group are going to like the deck construction, the active deck construction, especially between battles. My kids might over various sessions, but if I'm only playing it once a week or, you know, let alone like once a month, it's going to be a little bit harder to uptrack. Whereas this, you know, is a lot more straightforward. There's a little bit less upkeep. There's a little bit more ease in terms of configuring, especially between games. Now, I don't see a specific save mechanism. I'm not sure if that's included or not. Maybe I missed it, but I would hope that there's some way of being able to keep track of that because you are having experience and upgrades between games. So we'll see. I mean, like I said, I am definitely heavily leaning towards this base pledge, which is the expansion, which is 145, but may cost me another 40 bucks. And so I'm already at $185. And that's a hefty price. That is a hefty, hefty, hefty price. I am super hyped by it, but I'm also being very cautious because there's a lot of other stuff that I'm looking at and there's a lot of us that have catches my interest that may be able to hit the table easier. And that is the bottom line with the criteria. And that is the thing I never see in these quotes or in these preview videos is how easy is something like this to get to the table for the average person. So maybe I should make gameplay videos and talk about that. That's a whole nother video though. Okay, let's talk about the other monsters that launched Paladins of the West Kingdom City of Crowns. Shem Phillips, Scarfield Games, the expansion to Paladins of the West Kingdom. It's adding more of the good stuff, more of the stuff you love to see. <laughs> There's something to be said of transparency. And Shem says on here, you know what? We're not going to be offering exclusives. If it's better for you to pick up at retail, you know what? Go ahead and do that. We don't blame you either way. If you want to support us on here, that'd be super awesome too. And that's the type of stuff I love to see. It's just, it's just a little bit of a refreshing breath of air. This is not a game for me. I, I have no interest in this game, but from all accounts, from what I've read, the rule book, the videos of what else it's adding, it just seems to be adding, again, more of a good thing without overly complicating it. They're adding another whole sideboard over here that you have two separate actions, the muster and the negotiate. You're adding stuff on the main board as well in terms of outsiders and townsfolk that you're going to have new abilities to interact with. You're adding a couple more paladins as well. You're going to have a diplomacy attribute that you're sort of doing. And then you're going to have these things called King's Orders and King's Favors, which are bonuses as well as special secret agendas that you can get it fulfilled as well for extra points. So the, the only question is whether or not, depending on where you're at, depending on what the retail scene is like, is, is it going to be worth it to get now versus later? Because it's $28 plus the shipping for the English version being shipped in the US. And I think they talk about shipping at the bottom. So it's going to probably run you about 40 bucks. Do you think, are you willing to flip a coin and say, is this going to fit under the $40? If you get the shipping threshold of $100 $125 from one of the big marketers, and you're probably going to get a little bit later. I don't think there's a whole lot of exclusives. I mean, it's just, you get what you get. Now, the other side of things, and I'm not sure this is maybe where the break it or make it is for some of these people is the Paladins collector's box. So this is the thing that is going to fit everything. And they're throwing a mini expansion in with it, which adds yellow workers to the game. So and they can be placed on any spot, apparently, which is a nice variable. Mini expansions can be available in the promo store, but it's not available separately for this Kickstarter campaign. So you're either getting it with something else or you're just not getting it. Again, not a big Euro guy, but 
as far as what I know about the Euro side of things with a game like this, is he has a super good reputation for a reason. All of these games that he has put out in this trilogy of the West Kingdom are, are very well thought of. People very much like them. So I don't think that the quality of the game, the production of the game, the balancing of the game is going to be an issue. It's just whether or not you prefer to back it now or try your luck at retail to see if it's going to be any less or you can pick up things sort of piecemeal. You may be able to, you may not be. And that would probably be the one decision point. So all in all, that's the reason why it's got a $200,000. not over the top. You're not seeing deluxified everything. You're not seeing metal coins here and there, although I think they have some. But it's just, it's just nice for what it is sometimes to be a little bit on the simpler side. Less can be more in these campaigns. The other big one that launched today, which is surpassing both of the other two already, which is sort of surprising, but sort of not surprising as well, and that is the Ares Expedition, the Terraforming Mars, the card game. And I covered it a little bit last week in terms of the upcoming videos and what to expect, and this is already over 5,000 backers, and that's a lot more than I was expecting, but Terraforming Mars has sort of done what Wingspan did in terms of a retail presence in a game that really you wouldn't think that would be broadly as appealing as it is, but it clearly is, and I think that is the trickle over effect that you're seeing here with the over $300,000 because this again is not a super expensive pledge. I was honestly expecting this to be a lot higher pledge levels and so the price is actually somewhat decent, $39. The question, again, is just like with City of Crowns, do you pick it up now versus do you try and pick it up later? They have said there's not going to be a huge amount of exclusives, but they are doing some promos that may be available later depending on availability and depending on conventions. Sort of FOMO, but sort of, well, maybe it's not FOMO. The, the question, you know, and they're going to be day unlocks. So there you go. Day two unlock, and you're going to be a whole bunch of stuff. The usual guys have a whole bunch of stuff out here, although it's more of the Dice Tower Man versus Meeple side of things, whereas, you know, Quackalope and Board Game Co. tend to be heavier on the thematic Amerithrash type games. So you see a little bit of a dichotomy in, <laughs> with, with these types of games. They've got a couple add ons that you can be getting sleeves, resources, neoprene mat. So there's ways to nickel and dime you to make the expense much higher. You can also get all of the various Terraforming Mars products. I have not looked at this, and I think the big question is, especially for this one, I would say probably most of this stuff is better picked up at retail, except I'm not sure the retail availability of the big box and the 3D tiles. So that might be the big make it or break it in terms of if you aren't having anything to begin with. The price point may be the best from that aspect of things if you really feel like you need the big box and the 3D tiles. I do not know because the next lower level doesn't even include that. The highest level just basically adds that. And I don't really see it addressed here. And whether or not you could just get the big box or the 3D tiles as add-ons, because I don't see them specifically under the add-ons. So it makes me wonder if they're going to allow it. Let's check the FAQ a second here. Nope, they don't talk about it in the FAQ. So it just makes me wonder if it's really a need for you versus other people. If you're not familiar with the game itself, the game itself is very much like Race for the Galaxy. And if you're not familiar with Race for the Galaxy, let's talk about that for a second. So there are five phases in this game. You have planning, which is you are taking a look at the five cards that you have from the five actions or the five phases, and you're deciding which one to play. And from that, everybody plays one face down and you flip them all face up. And that is the resolve. And you resolve them in one through five order. You're either doing a development card, you're doing a construction, an action, a production, or a research. And so the interesting thing on this is, and sort of the different part of it is, all of these cards, when you're choosing the one through the five, you'll see on the blown up picture, they all have tops and bottoms here on the video. And if you have something that can be played in that phase, you can play it and get the top benefit. But if you played that card specifically, you also get the bonus that's on the bottom of the card. So you can be able to play in multiple rounds and have multiple advantages. Is it going to be more advantageous for you to play a card where you can get the extra bonus or just be able to play more cards in general? And then they've also said it's like Terraforming Mars, but they've made a few tweaks. They're trying to make it a little bit more simplified, but they're also trying to make it just a little bit more streamlined without losing some of the complexity that I think a lot of the hardcore Terraforming Mars fans are really interested in and we're waiting to see whether or not this holds up and so one they, way they've done that is you can see that there's just one central board again just like the base game but the difference is here is you are just laying out ocean tiles to begin with the ocean tiles are all face down and so whenever you would be able to produce an ocean or water and terraform it in that sense you're just flipping one over and getting whatever the bonus is you're still having the three main attributes around the side of the board in terms of production in terms of temperature in terms of oxygen you know that sort of thing you're all still doing that to get bonus points and to get end game conditions but 
What you're not doing is you also have eliminated the steel and the titanium as resources. You've eliminated energy completely. And the steel and titanium now just give you a discount in using other abilities or buying other things in the first place. That is sort of the general overview. Now there's also a co-op mode. There's a solo mode. If I hadn't been exposed to this at all, I think this would be a great, great, great entry point to see and to test the waters for someone who is more interested in this. Now, I will also say that especially if you have not played Race for the Galaxy, Race for the Galaxy is not the most linear game in terms of understanding. Many people will say the first couple of times you play it, it's going to be very confusing and it's a little bit harder to grasp your mind around. And so the question is, for someone new, is this going to be an easier entry point with the modifications that they've made from more of a Race for the Galaxy base to allow for easier entry rather than just more of a streamlined terraforming Mars? How much of the terraforming Mars do you need to be able to know to be able to understand this? Can you just jump right in? I don't know. That's the big question. But for the price point, $39, it's tempting for me, but I know that this is not my type of game. As tempting as it is, it's an easy pass for me. But I think that this is going to have broad appeal. And I like what they're bringing to the table. The artwork is better. Now they have to have better quality control because that is the biggest problem with some of the other projects, the Terraforming Mars base game in the first place, the insets, you know, things like that that need to be done well to have a well-rounded product instead of the Terraforming Mars, but Terraforming Mars, but this, but that you know, get rid of those butts. It's easy to do. You have a chance. You're using this as a pre-order system. Let's be honest, because this doesn't need to be on Kickstarter. But again, it is what it is. Say what you want about that, whichever way you feel on whichever side of the fence. That's it. There's a couple of videos. There's a little bit else. Check it out because I know this is going to appeal to a lot of people. The question is just, is it going to appeal to you? Is this going to change your mind if you were not a fan of terraforming Mars in the first place? I don't know. Next up is Ransom Notes, the ridiculous word magnet game. I mean, this is this is already almost at three times its funding goal. This reminds me of basically a word jumble game, sort of apples to apples, cards against humanity. That's the best way I can sort of describe it. You're just basically choosing this thing that says, you know, a certain thing. You pick magnet words together to make a sentence. And then the person, whoever is the judge that round picks their favorite and you get a point, I guess. So... That's about it. I mean, that's that's the whole page right there. So if that appeals to you, if you like something like that, if you like to be creative, if you like that sort of thing, if you want to be able to just create randomly, this is your sort of thing. There's not much else to talk about it. It's either going to be a hit or a miss for you. And 722 people are already saying it's a hit for them. So check it out if that's your thing. So let's talk about two more big ones, at least in general, one for me and one for everybody else. One for me is block and key. And now I mentioned this last week as something that was really going to catch my eye and really interesting. It is already funded. Almost 700 people are backing this at this point. It is a abstract game. If you don't like abstract games, you should probably turn away right now and just pass this one by and go to the last one, which may be more of your interest. But I think it's worth a shot because you can see right here, the design aesthetic is really different because what you're doing is you are taking a row or a column of these pieces along the bottom and you're taking all of them, not just one piece. And then you are placing one on top in order to match a pattern, as you can see, sort of the patterns on the cards right here in the first place. $42 is the pledge plus shipping in the US. That's it. That's the only pledge level. Boom. There's going to be some sort of retail version. They don't talk about it a whole lot on the page, but you'll just have to kind of wait and see if you back on the first day. So unfortunately, probably after you guys see this, uh, you might get your name on the box. <laughs> so not too much of an early bird if you're missing it. So it's still worth checking it out. Like I said, this is a three dimensional puzzle, which you are only manipulating and worrying about your two dimensional side that is literally in front of you. And that is where this stack comes in is because one, you can then be more compact on your tabletop. And then two, it gives it more of an eye level. So you're not constantly trying to bend over and kind of do this sort of thing. And you know, that element or issue. So it's nice. And then it just is a key feature of the game in general so that you're not trying to guess as much and it's constantly in front of you so that the AP then is probably lessened than it would be otherwise. And what matters is that two dimensional view of having the right cubes in the right lineup in a row that match your point card. They're doing clay blocks, they're doing as much cardboard as possible. And they say at the bottom of the Kickstarter page, they're trying to use as little plastic as possible. So I give them a lot of kudos for that. Here, you can kind of see the setup of an example of 
It doesn't have to be exact. It doesn't have to be nothing else around it in that sense, but it has to line up to what this is. There are already some color issues that they've said with some of the clay block that they're working on the manufacturer for. So that's going to be improved. Hopefully it's not another Iwari situation where one just is clearly not right, but they're already working on that. They're already aware of it. It's already, you know, pretty much finalized in terms of design. And that is why also I love seeing this. And I have to think that this is probably going to be pretty accurate of September of 2021, which is an amazingly great turnaround but then again it's relatively straightforward the box making sure the box elements are lined up dimensions are right then you've got the cubes and you've got the cards i mean that's about it here you go you just take any row or column of three blocks put them in your bag on your turn you can either take or place it's literally that simple and you get to see it from two different angles they give an example of a couple things you can and can't do including bridges and are okay but overhangs off of a bridge are not okay so there's a few more nuances like that that you just have to be aware of going into it but honestly it looks like a fantastic abstract game i'm excited about this i think this is probably going to be easier to hit the table than a lot of other stuff this would be a great game for me and my wife i really like the idea of this i'm backing it i'm almost certainly going to keep this unless something else pops up more interesting, which I doubt. This is the whole campaign. This is everything you need to know. So that is block and key. Now, I would be amiss if I didn't talk about this, and this is the other big brother on the hill eclipsing all of the other ones right now. Simon launched their latest iteration, I think the eighth version of Zombicide. Zombicide Undead or Live with the Western theme. I'm going to do a whole video on this, whether or not you should back it. I think it's that worth it. It's that popular. The real question on everyone's mind, though, Simon, why the Wednesday launch at 3 p.m.? No Tuesday launch at 3 p.m.? What happened? I mean, that's been a staple of things, right? Anyway, being sarcastic aside, this is the latest one. They have gotten away from the early birds. They've gotten away from that sort of thing that a lot of people complained about. There's one pledge level right now for $100. Basic Simon. I imagine in the next day or two, they will announce the big gameplay expansion and the pledge level for $150. That will include a big gameplay. My big question, as I joked about last week, is the over-under is five expansions, including gameplay and non-gameplay. So let me know in the comments below if you are an over or an under person. And we'll, we'll see where things end up and we'll tally the results and maybe I'll talk about it next week. <laughs> So anyway, what makes this new? What makes this different? They've added a few elements. They've changed a few things. They've tried to make it more streamlined. They're trying to just basically hit every single genre of mass appeal that they can to have this obviously be their flagship across the board. So what do you actually need to know? I mean, they talk about the classes, the different classes. I mean, these are reskins. They're slight tweaks, but they're reskins called another name. You've got your pledge right here, 14 survivors, 4, 4, 4, and 2, which means these two faithful, which are kind of like your clerics. You're going to be seeing more of those maybe in the stretch goals. You're getting 73 zombies, including the four different types, all of which have different attributes, different damages, and different uh, weaknesses. And then you just get the whole bunch of other stuff that you get. Now, this is the one thing that you're going to see the new that's different is one of the things being train tiles, where you have a train that is going across the center of the board or part of the board that can work to your advantage or work to your disadvantage because you can't jump over it. You can't pass through parts of it, but it can just run into zombies and run them over even if they're the abomination. Quackalope with Board Game Co. and a couple other people did a gameplay video. It's about two hours long. It is a online version of the game though it's not a hands-on prototype watcher beware if if you're like me and it's a little bit harder to focus with all of the jumping around with the camera and the computer side of things so it, it's definitely a little bit of a harder watch than a physical prototype just so you guys know now this rule book and i'm going to talk about this more in my whether or not you should back it video this is a 54 page rule book i'll give them kudos i've never seen them put out this complete of a rule book on day one let alone probably during any campaign so We'll wait to see whether or not they'll actually have the tabletop simulator demo available for everyone like they did in Massive Darkness, because I, I think that helped them. I think it also hurt them. And so whether or not they have it, I think is going to be directly related to how they thought it affected Massive Darkness sales. Bunch of pre-painted one pictures. They're doing a daily unlock. They're also doing stretch goals because they tend to space out their stretch goals way too much after a couple days so right now they're only at about 30,000 apart uh but I'm assuming by the tomorrow we'll already be at 50,000 or something like that uh 35,000 already so they're already starting to stretch out and shipping Simon it's going to be a boatload because these are massive packages if you saw the Bloodborne one so as much as people complain about it 
you're getting a ton of stuff. I think I'll also talk about in my video of how does this compare, or maybe I'll do a separate video of how does this compare to the other zombicides out there and which one is right for you. So right there, two videos. If you're a Zombicide fan at all, um, that should be of interest for you in the future. It's Zombicide. It's got some streamlined rules. It's got a lot of other stuff going on. I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time here knowing that I'm going to put another video out uh, because I know this video has been long enough. But if you're interested and you want the Simon experience, i.e. a lot of miniatures, a good amount of resale value and completeness, this is the way to go because the resale value on these is almost always more at retail after the Kickstarter campaign delivers. It's just how much of its value does it hold. Completionists out there are gonna get hammered probably between $300 and $400 before all is said and done. So if you're a completionist, you probably wanna stay away. But otherwise, hopefully, this is better than the previous iterations, which is sort of a blessing and a curse. Sometimes it can make your old versions obsolete. So otherwise it can make them just more unique because some games have some elements and other games do not have certain elements. All in all, it's gonna go for three weeks. So you're gonna have plenty of time. I just hope that we either get X-Men or He-Man after this. <laughs> that's that's what I've been waiting for. So this was an easy pass for me, but I know a lot of people do enjoy Zombicide. I mean, it's already at 7,000 backers, which is a ton. And so it'll probably end up in the low 20,000 backers total. So there you go. So that is the Kickstarter roundup of the stuff that launched. A ton of stuff. I'm sorry this video was so long. But as I'll state elsewhere in the future, I don't just like reading you a short synopsis or a purely value. Is this going to hold value? Is this a good value sort of thing? Anybody can read the board game geek synopsis or give you something that's pre-scripted or talk about just from a pure money standpoint. I think you deserve more. And so that's why each one of these games gets as much info as I can with as much rule book and as much gameplay idea behind it. And so hopefully that is useful. Hopefully that is why you're tuning in and watching this in the first place. And hopefully that is something that sets me apart from other people that you will tune into in the future. So I really thank you for that. If you like this, I am trying to figure out the direction of the channel like everybody else in this situation. Throw me a subscription. I'm trying to figure out what to do elsewise with the channel. Monetary issues are a big side of things as much as we hate to talk about them and hate to debate about them. I'm going to have a video coming out soon as well about that and a little bit of everything else and just kind of see what you guys want. So as always, thanks for taking the time to watch. I appreciate it. Let me know what you like or don't like in the comment section below. As a last side note, watch out for this weekend's upcoming video for Kickstarter's launching next week. It is going to be even longer potentially than this. There is even more stuff launching next week than launched this week. So wallets beware. Stay classy. I'll see you around.